You'd all know why they call me bird legs if you saw me in my baggies, right? And so, surfer nicknames are always based on some physical deformity. That's what mine is. A lot of them are descriptive. Flea, one of the Mavericks contest winners, was called Flea because he's a little guy. Somebody asked Wingnut where he got his name. Wingnut's a famous surfer. And he said, I don't remember, but I'm sure he was bigger than me. <laughs> um, but I'm, some of them, they could be worse than bird legs. Uh, I met a guy named Stinky a couple of years ago. <laughs> I said, how'd you get that name? And I was kind of afraid to ask, you know, but I did. And he said, oh, it's my own damn fault. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I thought it'd be kind of cool to have a surfer nickname. He was a surfer. And he said, I told my friends I wanted them to call me The Breeze because I thought that was kind of cool and casual and... They went, eh, no, you can't make up your own surfer nickname. Second, because you tried. And third, because you came up with a really sappy one. From now on, you will forever be known as Stinky. <laughs> so go ahead and mock my deformity in public here, Bob. I'll get you for this. The title of my talk today was going to be about surfers becoming in danger of being the beachless boys. And that came from a headline of an editorial I wrote for a Los Angeles newspaper in 1989. I said in that article that the beaches were starving for sand, and we know why it's happening, and we know how to fix it. I said that there were two reasons. First, that we had built about 1,400 dams in California since the 1850s, and there are millions of cubic yards of sediment laid in sand, backed up behind those 1,400 dams, and all we needed to do was tear them down. Sounds pretty easy. And we'd also built 100 miles of seawalls that keep the bluffs from eroding, which contribute their part of making beaches, and all we had to do was stop doing that. Well, it all sounds pretty easy. Um, but uh, I know that you, of all people, know these things because Doug Edman started writing about it down at Scripps in 1950. Um, Gary Griggs helped me on that article 26 years ago, and I see he's one of the, the experts in that great new movie about sand. If you haven't seen that, go buy a copy and show it to your friends that called Sand Wars. Very important movie, a documentary film about the value of sand and sand poachers and gangsters and uh, dredging the, the bottom of sand in Australia and making islands in Dubai. And it was the international consequences of sand that I way beyond what I knew about. 1999, Leslie Ewing and Orville Magoon put together this fabulous book uh, that Eric's looking at called uh, What Sand Writes 99, right? Well, it had, has everything in there. As it works out, we have not had the muscle to bring the beaches back. Um, 26 years have flown by, and we've made practically no progress. I uh, confidently predicted in that editorial that the work tearing down the Matilaha Dam east of Ventura could begin as early as fall that year, 1989. They're still <laughs> dithering about it. I got some hope on that project in 2007 when it's, the papers reported that the Congress had allocated $140 million to start tearing down the project. But as it works out, the Congress didn't really appropriate the money to the Army Corps of Engineers, so they didn't really have the money. So another seven years has gone by with nothing being done except more dithering. I can't understand why when we had both the support, of, the support of both Barbara Boxer and Dianne Feinstein and Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt at that time, that we couldn't get something started there. What's wrong with us? Why do we keep making these same mistakes? Why do we do nothing when we know that we're supposed to do things so often? In spite of all the scientific advancement and the sophisticated technology, why do we keep on making the same mistakes over and over again? We know better, but we keep allowing society to do them. Caltrans is going to try and correct an Army Corps of Engineers mistake with a mistake of their own down at the Princeton Breakwater, just south of here. 
um, by building another seawall when they should be thinking about managed retreat. Now, it may be of some comfort to know that the United States isn't the only country that's uh, making mistakes over and over again. In England, the university at Oxford University, my daughter works there, so I know these things. Uh, Oxford came up with a new department just to try and study and convince the English government not to keep making the same mistakes. And they said, we want to make new mistakes. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great attitude and it's a great thing to think about. Um, you people are scientists and scholars and professionals and planners. Um, my background is, is political science. I, uh, I appreciate why scientists don't draw firm conclusions on things. That's a scientific principle. That's one of the good things about science, is to remain open-minded and to know that there's more information that's going to come down the pipeline. But I thought that Sarah made a very good point this morning when she said we can't be paralyzed by science. We have to, we have, to have action here, folks. These issues are too serious to be dithering and having little bureaucratic turf wars and uh, phony ideological differences that uh, inhibit us from, make, from doing stuff. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt said, it's a common sense to take a method, try it, and if it fails, admit it frankly, and try something else. But above all, try something. That's what we have to do here, I think, on all these climate change things. We can't just be... It doesn't take another 2,000 top brain PhD guys from around the world to say climate change is happening. The armadillos have moved into Illinois. I mean, what does that tell you, folks? <laughs> it's too bad we can't get some politicians that have the IQs of armadillos. Um, you, s scientists, scientists need to do a much better job at defending science. The National Geographic did a story a couple months ago called The Attack on Science, or The War on Science, they called it. Um, and it's true. I mean, there, there's big areas of this country where ignorance and superstition is going unchallenged. We need, to, we need to be better at it. The scientists need to be better. The planners need to be better. Us advocates need to be better. We've got a lot of work to do, and we're not doing a very good job at it, is my attitude. Now, ants and the picnic. Um, w there's, three com there's three members of the Congressional Science Committee that think the Earth is 9,000 years old. They, I, I don't know if they think the Earth is flat, uh, but you, <laughs> we've got to combat stuff like that. We've got big, big work to do. One of the members thinks the Earth is uh, 9,000 years old, and... Uh, doesn't believe that there's any evidence for climate change. Senator Inhofe is still calling it a hoax. I mean, that is not to the credit of the people of Oklahoma, in my mind. I, I mean, the only thing I can see about, the only thing I can see positive about climate change and sea level rise and global warming is that we're going to lose a lot of Florida. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, and I like the idea of gondolas in the financial district here in San Francisco, though. That's, I, I, can picture, I can envision that as the long-range strategy. We need scientists and educated people to provide solutions. They need to be practical. We need to work together better. We need to get over our prejudices and, and resolve issues. We need to streamline the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy, all the thousands of people that are involved in these coastal decisions. I just, I worked for the bureaucracy. I know what it's like to be a bureaucrat. And you think, oh my God, how are you going to get 30 people in a room and decide something about the, the grain of sand size and the things like that? I, in some ways, I think we got too many people working on this stuff. But uh, if we are working on it, we've got to work together better. We've got to cooperate better. We've got to get results is the main thing. In that editorial, I, I said that I thought that sand should be considered to be a flowing resource, like water, and that sand should be protected under the public trust doctrine, like water. Then I found out Orville Magoon was saying that uh, years ago, too, and it was one of the champions of that. 
we met with, the, me and one of the other Surfrider Foundation members met with the State Lands Commission attorneys back then and said, hey, how about this is an idea? And they just kind of scoffed at us. They kind of just said, uh, well, you'll have to sue us to get us to focus on that. Well, that's a bad public attitude in my mind. And I don't know if it's, somebody said the State Lands Commission isn't here today, but I would think Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom's going to run for governor here pretty soon, and he's on the State Lands Commission. I think he could use that as a, a good campaign issue. It's a great idea. It's an important idea. And I don't know what happened to it or why it didn't. I know I didn't do anything more. I wrote the editorial, and then I went off and did other things. So I'm partly to blame, too. And if that dam ends up collapsing, that the Matillaha Dam collapses and it kills a bunch of people, it's not going to make me feel any better to feel that I was right, that that dam should be torn down and that a lot of those dams should be torn down and we should be doing that. Somebody said earlier that sediment transport issues are really an important thing. I think that you guys should start looking in how do we get all the sediment behind all those 1,400 dams down to the, the, the beach again. It shouldn't be in trucks. I don't like the idea of trucking the sediment down. There's got to be some ways that they can slurry things down and figure it out so it doesn't kill the fish. And those are things for you smart guys to figure out. But I know it's doable. I mean, the nature did it fine without us for uh, eons, right? So got the sand down to the beach. So it, it can happen. In political science, you learn that in all cultures, whether it's large nations or small tribes, you find out that 20% of the people influence the other 80%. The 20% are called the opinion leaders. Opinion leaders are people that are educated, they're up on the issues, they're respected by their friends and their peers as being knowledgeable about something. I'm, a, I'm an opinion leader in the surfer community. Most of my surfer friends know that for some reason I'm interested in politics and I, I like that. Others say that I'm interested in politics because I'm like the Irish guy that's going down the street and he sees two guys fighting and he goes up and says, hey, is this a personal fight or can anybody get involved? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you, you, Bob was threatening to call me a troublemaker before. I, I said, well, that wouldn't be the first time. But what I wanted to say is that you're opinion leaders. And you have more influence than you probably really understand. And so I'm going to ask you to do a better job at, being, at uh, leading more people. Um, they said in the panel this morning, we need to influence more people. Well, she didn't say at the end of her, dis her description of things to do is voting. Is making sure that you vote, making sure that your friends vote. That we, we have the best congressional delegation of any place in the country here in the Bay Area. There's nobody in the Bay Area that would ever try to run for office without having a good environmental platform and good environmental credentials. And that's to our credit as voters. For 40 years, we've been good at that. We've elected smart people, we've elected good people, we've elected honest people. And we, if, if the whole country and the whole world was being run by the California Congressional District and uh, Governor Brown and the, the good people that we've elected here in California, I think the world would be better off if California was in charge more. <laughs> but there, we have to have the vision, and the last thing I'll say is that in the 1800s there was a man named uh, William Ng, Dean Ng they called him, he was the, the head of the St. Paul's Church in London, and he said something that I think is what I just want to leave you with, and that he said, we shall have to fight the politician who knows only that posterity has no votes. And since posterity has done nothing for him, he need do nothing for posterity. I say, go get him. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor to be here.